Great. So yes, so good morning. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining this event. Um, we have over 800 participants, which is quite outstanding. I'm Yvonne Hatz-Pietre, Director of Public Affairs at the International Fertilizer Association, IFA, and it is now my great pleasure to moderate the first webinar of this brand new plant nutrition innovation series co-organized by the FAO and the Fertilizer Association. For this inaugural event, it is um, also a privilege to have with us Dr. Cha, um, the director of FAO's plant, Protect plant Production and Protection Division. Um, Dr. Cha will provide some background to this joint project and explain also how it all aligns with FAO's strategy and goals. Now, this series is dedicated to the numerous innovations in the plant nutrition sector that transform the way we produce food and help to shape more sustainable and resilient agricultural systems. A lot is happening in the plant nutrition space to address more and more effectively the double challenge of increasing yields for a growing world population without putting further stress on the environment. For the plant nutrition industry, this means working with researchers to provide farmers with a number of tools to help them optimize their crop production and facing the droughts, floods, and these unusual temperature spikes that climate change imposes increasingly on them. Underlying to all this, however, is the very idea of understanding better nature, innovative application and use methods, innovative design, material productions, they all take their inspiration from nature and are designed to help farmers to use and adapt better to nature. And the topic of our webinar is the perfect illustration of a nature-based solution that contributes to boost the protection and performance of soils and plants. Actually, microbes have always been present in and around the plants and have naturally developed numerous symbioses to stimulate plant growth. Exploring these interactions, finding new ways of making them purpose, purposefully available to plants is one of the many new biological solutions that are being proposed to farmers today. But nature is complicated, and so are the microbial solutions for plant nutrition. Our excellent speakers today will explain how research and commercial developments work hand in hand to overcome these challenges and amplify their potential for the future of agriculture. But before we start, um, let me just briefly remind you of a few housekeeping rules. The whole webinar will be held in English, but interpretation is available in Arabic, Chinese, and French. And you can find it in the Zoom at the bottom bar uh, on your screen. The webinar is recorded, and if you would like to watch again some of these interventions, you can always view it from the FAO channel on YouTube um, later on. Um, during the webinar, um, you will all be muted, but if you have specific questions for our panelists, um, please use the Q&I box. We will select some of them and we will uh, try to answer them um, at the end of, of the session. Um, should you exchange greetings or write more general comments, please do not use the Q&A box, please use the chat box. And it is now my great pleasure and immense honor to hand over the microphone to Dr. Cha, the director of FAO's Plan Production and Protection Division, who will inaugurate our event today. Dr. Cha, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Ivana, uh, the chair of this webinar. Dear colleague, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this first webinar on sustainable plant nutrition series. Join today hosted by FEO Technical Network on sustainable crop production and agroecology and the plant production and the protection division, NSP, together with the International Fertilizer Association, AFA. It is well known that the global population 
it projected to rise to 9.7 billion by 2050. To match this growth in population, we will need to produce about over more 70, 60% of more food, which will be mainly depend upon increasing the crop productivity through varietal improvement, balanced nutrition, better irrigation, and effective pest management. It has been shown that the average percentage of yield increased contributed by fertilizer is about ranged from 30 to 50%. In some area, even over maybe over 70%. So you can see fertilizer is really food of a crop. It's very important. The objective for this collaborative webinar series is to highlight how new plant nutrition solution can contribute the enhanced crop productivity. At the same time, also ensure environmental sustainability and human health. This webinar series is closed aligned with four better of a new FEO strategic framework for 2022 to 2031. What is for better? Better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. Therefore, this contribution to Sustainable Development Goal SDGs. This webinar series is also closely related to renewed mission of the NSP, this division, enabling transition to more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable crop production and protection through optimization and minimization. FEO's work on innovation for sustainable agricultural production system will mainly focus on biofertilizer option because this is an important technology tool to increase crop productivity and at the same time minimizing negative impact to our environment. In this area, a close collaboration among research, academia, and the private sector is badly needed in supporting transformative change and the transition towards sustainable agricultural and agricultural food system. More specifically, today, we would like to raise awareness of the benefit and the potential of microbia as a new available tool to our smallholder farmers to improve their plant nutrition in context of an integrated approach. Take this opportunity, I would like to acknowledge the long-standing cooperation between the FAO and the AFA in sharing of fertilizer statistic and also a shared interest in promotion of international code of conduct for sustainable use and the management of fertilizer. We are committed to promote integrated, efficient, and effective use of fertilizer. To assist, to assist stakeholder in establishing the system for monitoring 
the production, distribution, quality, management, and the use of fertilizer to support sustainable agricultural development. The FAO will continue to create space where the best science and the plant nutrition products available from private sector partners can reach to all farmers to contribute to a sustainable plant nutrition and so to achieve SDG. In this, this is in also alignment with FEO commitment to improving sustainability of agro food system while minimizing negative impact of our nature environment. In this aspect, the role of a private sector is essential. I can show you there is great news, I can say good news now. FEO strategy on private sector engagement for 2021-2025 has been approved at the 165th Council last December in 2020. Dear colleague, ladies and gentlemen, the World Agricultural and Agri-Food System are not presently delivering desired outcome of food security and the nutrition. And the green innovation that we will discuss today are a step in the right direction. Lysogen fixation is the most effective and the efficient green innovation for plant nutrition. The two outstanding experts today, and the Dr. Manish, professor from the University of Jehov, Jehov, sorry, Jehov, and Dr. Jim Mark, the Global Technical Marketing Director, and this is the name in plant care, will present their brainless thought and the rich experience in green plant nutrition technology to smallholder farmers. This is the first in the series of webinar and jointly organized by FEO and AFA, which will also clearly demonstrate important role of private sector in achievement of 2030 agenda. I'm looking forward for enjoying the presentation and the discussion today. And I wish you all a very successful and productive webinar. I thank you all. Over to you, Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Cha, for these thoughtful and really stimulating remarks. I think this was an idle way of setting the scene and indicating the roadmap towards more sustainability. Um, a journey which is which is paced, as you indicated, with innovations, but also with a significant change in agricultural practices. Um, before we start with our first speaker, I just wanted to apologize for the technical glitches with uh, the interpretations. Thank you so much for your patience. It seems like our technical problems are resolved now. And so now we are moving on um, to Dr. Manish Raizada, Professor of the Department of Plant Agriculture at the University of Guelph in Canada, um, where his lab focuses on the discovery, testing, and improvement of probiotic microbes for crops and the development of low-cost sustainable agriculture kits to empower farmers. Dr. Raizada, will explain to us the science, opportunities, and challenges of nitrogen fixing and nutrient microbials for smallholder farmers. Dr. Raizada, the micro is yours. Thank you, Dr. Harz Petra. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Shah. It's an honor to be here today with FAO and IFA and your participants. Uh, greetings, good morning from, from Canada. Um, 
with permission from FAO and IFA, my, my talk will be a little bit longer than 20 minutes today uh, in order to ensure that everyone has uh, a good introduction to the topic. Uh, so the, the, field, the picture I'm showing you on your screen is a field of maize, but the intriguing picture on the upper right are root hair cells and the green dots are a, a bacteria that we discovered that helps to solubilize rock phosphorus um, in those root hair cells. So today what I'm going to talk about are, I'm going to introduce you to microbial biofertilizers, discuss specific types of microbial biofertilizers, make the general argument for the use of microbes in the tropics and subtropics, discuss disadvantages of biofertilizers, and then discuss future and uh, current and future access uh, to biofertilizers by smallholder farmers. So let me jump in. Let me talk about the evolution of life. So plants evolved in a world in which, two, in which bacteria had two billion prior years to evolve clever nutrient acquisition and also defense strategies. And by making friends, plants could depend on microbes for critical functions. So for example, obtaining nutrients or protection. Now, what's interesting is that most critical plant hormones, such as indolacetic acid or auxin, which initiates new roots, originated from bacteria during evolution and persist today, which means that a bacterial spray can fundamentally control plant growth. For example, new roots for better uptake of fertilizers. Now imagine if this was true for humans. Imagine if I sprayed a probiotic microbe on you and you grew a new arm. That is what is equivalent in this case. And in the diagram that you're seeing on the right, what is showing are microbes uh, that associate with the roots are producing IAA, uh, and in fact, that signaling actually alters flowering time and hence seed production. So microbes have a, a very big role to play in terms of controlling plant behavior. Today, microbes live inside and on the surface of plants. How many? The answer is millions, billions, and trillions. And combined, they constitute the plant microbiome. So if you look at the top row of bacteria per gram of plant tissue or soil, it's divided into below ground and above ground uh, plant niches. You can see in terms of abundance, we are talking of, about trillions of individual bacterial cells. And in terms of bacterial species diversity, it could be as many as a million species associated with the roots and, uh, and hundreds or more associated above ground. And similarly, a large number of fungi. Where are plant-associated microbes located? If you look to the right of your screen, we can divide it into two general zones, above ground, the phylosphere, and below ground, uh, outside of the roots, the rhizosphere. Within that, there are two other categories. So microbes that are inside plants, which could be inside the roots, inside the leaves, we refer to those as endophytes, endophytic microbes. If they're on the surface of plants, it could be on the surface of roots, leaves, we refer to those as epiphytes. Underground, you find many microbes associated right on the root surface. That is termed the rhizoplane. Uh, they can be associated with root hairs, uh, where primary absorption of nutrients occurs. What we find is when we start to tag individual microbes, in this case with green fluorescent protein, so an individual microbial strain appears green, we can see that they're not randomly located, particularly under stress conditions, whether it's a pathogen stress or nutrient stress, um, they, they may localize to specific locations. In general, we find microbes located in between plant cells, in the vascular tissue, root hairs, uh, the root surface, my lab has found them in, in maize silks, in maize seeds, very recently in maize pollen. Uh, what you can see on the bottom left is a single root hair projection, and it is full of a particular type of bacteria that we discovered in my lab. On the bottom right on that image, what you're seeing on the longitudinal axis is, is one root, and the long green stripe is probably a million bacterial cells sitting right on the surface of the root, between the root and the root hairs. Interestingly, microbes can be mobile inside plants. So unlike plant cells, which are locked in by cell walls, this allows them to target pathogens and perhaps uh, seek nutrient opportunities. In the image I'm showing you is an experiment we did many years ago where we micro injected particular bacterial strains into the stem of maize, and then we watched them. Where did they end up? 
And one particular microbe, Enterobacteria espuriae, ended up in the rhizosphere. So it actually traveled to the root and exited out. And what we discovered subsequently is that microbe solubilizes rock phosphorus. Seeds also carry uh, microbes, and it appears that seeds carry some of their own plant and a, a subset of rhizospheric microbes, especially on the seed surface. Uh, what I'm showing you here are barley seeds, and on the right is an image uh, where you, you can look at the barley seed coat, and the green is showing you just below the surface uh, bacteria, which upon seed germination, those bacteria can potentially coat the roots and potentially uh, become the founders of the rhizosphere. Where do plant-associated microbes originate from? Well, two areas. Acquisition, there can be acquisition of microbes from the surrounding environment, most famously from the soil. And these microbes get into cracks in the roots. They can come from above ground through leaf pores through the stomata. Microbes can also be inherited uh, to the progeny via seed. We can look at humans. Um, you know, um, humans have, the, uh, similarly, can acquire um, microbes from the environment and from a parent. We know during COVID that there is person-to-person -person transmission of, of, in this case, a, a pathogenic virus. Uh, so similarly, plants can also acquire uh, microbes from their environment. In humans, uh, bacteria are transmitted from the mother to the child. Uh, during uh, through the vaginal canal at birth, also through breast milk. Similarly, we know that microbes can be inherited through seeds in plants. So that brings us to the topic today. What are microbial biofertilizers? Microbial biofertilizers, also known as inoculants or biologicals, are microbes, including bacteria or fungi, that can be sprayed onto plants or soil or coated onto seeds to reduce chemical fertilizers and or improve their usage better efficiency, solubility, or uptake. A farmer may add uh, more of a naturally occurring microbe or swap beneficial microbes be between different plants or introduce a bred or improved microbe, what we might term an elite strain. These microbes can then inhabit specific plant tissues. They can be mobile. They can accumulate um, in the soil over time and build up reservoirs. It's very similar to the endogenous plant microbiome. What are some of the steps in terms of producing or applying a biofertilizer? One has to cultivate the microbe, formulate it, and then apply it. They can be applied onto seeds, um, onto soils as a foliar spray. So if I go into that in, uh, in a little bit more depth. So step one is again to acquire or cultivate microbes from plants or soil, and then they can be stored in the freezer indefinitely. So that requires a government microbiology lab or a company, for example. The microbes then are multiplied in liquid, liquid culture. So that requires some infrastructure and trained personnel, which it can be a bottleneck in some developing nations. And then one can formulate a starting population of microbes by coating it onto a solid carrier for shipment. That can be sterile peat, some sort of a hydrogel, et cetera. And then they must be shipped under sterile conditions. Now, microbes often die in hot weather or can get contaminated, which are very serious issues, particularly in the tropics and subtropics. So then step four, the farmer then ultimately has to prepare and add the biofertilizer microbes to his seed um, or, or onto, this, the, uh, onto his or her seed or onto the plant. And what, you're showing, what I'm showing you here is an image of a farmer um, adding a biofertilizer onto their seed uh, prior to planting. Now, there are some interesting questions here. Will it be a man or a woman farmer who will buy and prepare? What is the training required? Um, there may be literacy issues, access issues, purchasing power issues. It, it is sometimes a little bit complicated. I'm showing you on the left here a package of rhizobia biofertilizer for legumes developed by the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, IITA, in Nigeria. And what you can see here is there are a few steps. This is not as simple as applying a chemical fertilizer. First, there must be some sort of a sticking agent, particularly if the, if the biofertilizer is to stick to seeds. So the, the sticker has to be prepared. In this case, it's gum arabic. Then uh, the sticker has to be applied onto the seeds. And then the inoculant usually has to be mixed, perhaps with water, reconstituted, and then applied to the sticker. So this does require some level of, of training and literacy. 
So with that introduction to microbial biofertilizers, I'd like to now discuss the specific types of microbial biofertilizers. There are many. I'm going to discuss a few highlights. If you look at uh, the root zone around plants, we all know that plants require many macro and micronutrients. I'm going to discuss a few in particular today that are relevant to the most popular biofertilizers. Let me first talk about reviewing um, uh, chemical nitrogen fertilizer production. Um, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers are made by taking uh, N2 gas, nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, which has a triple chemical bond and requires high heat to break it to convert into ammonia, which is a usable form. This consumes high levels of natural gas. What is interesting is that there are bacteria able to break that triple bond in N2 gas. So uh, in each of these slides, I'm going to box a particular nutrient flow that is catalyzed by a particular type of biofertilizer. And in the text box, I'm going to explain a little bit more about it. So in this case, an N2 gas is converted by ammonia. Uh, in this case, I'm referring to symbiotic nitrogen fixation with legume crops, such as beans, lentils, soybeans. The mechanism is that the bacteria have an enzyme called nitrogenase, which converts N2 gas to ammonia in specialized underground root nodules. The species of bacteria, or the genera in this case, are rhizobium, brady rhizobium, mesorhizobium, and others. These bacteria can fix between 50 to 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year at a low cost. The inoculant cost here is typically $3 to $10 US, US dollars per hectare. So it looks like this. Um, I'm showing you here uh, soybean roots. They have these specialized plant organs called nodules. If I were to look within an individual cell, an individual plant cell uh, within that nodule. In this case, again, uh, you, you see a rhizobia cell tagged in green, and you can see a copious, a large amount of these cells. And what these bacteria are doing with nitrogenase, again, is breaking that triple bond of N2 and making ammonia. Now, legumes can recruit soil bacteria, these rhizobia bacteria, to inhabit root nodules where they fix nitrogen. But the efficiency of nitrogen fixations can sometimes be improved using either more or improved rhizobia bacterial inoculants. T two new innovations in this area is that um, Mariana Hungria and her colleagues in Brazil have shown that repeated rhizobia inoculation uh, during a single growing season in soybean results in, in substantially higher yields. Similarly, um, her lab and others around the world have shown that combining rhizobia with azosporillium bacteria or, or a mycorrhizal fungi also can result in higher yields. So a combinatorial approach. Sticking to nitrogen fixation, there are another class of nitrogen fixing microbes that don't occupy nodules, but instead, for example, lives, live in stems or between cells or in roots. We call this associative nitrogen fixation. This is found in sugar canes. Um, there's a hunt for it in cereals, such as rice, wheat, and maize. It's the same, mecha same mechanism, bacterial enzyme nitrogenase converts N2 gas to ammonia in stems, roots, and leaves in exchange in both these cases for sugar, because this is an energy energetically expensive process. The most famous of these bacteria are azosporillum and azetobacter. Um, these can deposit between 15 to 160 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. In, in studies, one finds a tenfold variation even within a crop such as sugarcane, and I'll discuss that significant variation later. What's caused some excitement recently is a discovery first by Mexican scientists and uh, elaborated more by American scientists, which is that a very tall ancient maize plant, um, a land race called Sierra Mixe of in, in, uh, from, uh, uh, from southern Mexico, can fix nitrogen in aerial brace roots. And that fixation happens in mucilage, as you can see on the bottom left. So this is a very unusual plant. It produces a lot of these brace roots. It's a very tall plant, and it has many of these brace roots. And this mucilage is, again, full of different types of sugar, and it's full of nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which can supply, it's reported, between 30 to 80 percent of this plant's nitrogen requirement. And there's efforts now to transfer this into hybrid maize. Now, in this sphere of nitrogen fixation, one shouldn't forget this symbiosis, which is that in flooded rice paddies, one can see algae on the surface. Uh, excuse me, it's, one can see a water fern, a zola. And this zola 
has a symbiotic relationship in between its little leaves between with Anabacteria, uh, Anabina, which you can see in panel C, D, and E. Um, and this is a, um, uh, a blue-green algae which can fix nitrogen. And uh, uh, it ultimately deposits this in rice paddies. And what you can see on the bottom right here is a smallholder farmer pre preparing an Azola anabina starting culture. Interestingly, um, because uh, Azola is associating with, uh, with, with a nitrogen fixer, it has a, a high level of amino acids, since nitrogen is a building block for amino acids. And hence, this has turned, turned out to be a high protein feed that can be fed to livestock. So this is actually an Azola farm meant for livestock feed. Now, nitrogen fixation can also happen. I, I've just mentioned the rice paddy. Nitrogen fixation can also happen underground in the rhizosphere. Same mechanism, the bacterial enzyme nitrogenase. Uh, this is a um, bacterial genera, typically Klebsiella, uh, for corn, bacillus for wheat, blue-green algae for rice paddy. The fixation level here is lower, 10 to 25 kilograms per nitrogen per hectare per year. There is a US company, for example, there's, there's several startup companies in Canada and the US in this space. In this case, uh, this company, uh, Pivot Bio, is using gene edit, editing and synthetic biology to optimize a nitrogen fixing rhizospheric bacteria, Klebsiella. Uh, and their claim in field trials is it's supplying about 20% of the nitrogen demand for hybrid corn. I realize this may be a small slide. What I wanted to just show you um, is the increase in grain yield compared to the non inoculated control for various crops and microorganisms uh, that fix nitrogen. And you can see that there's a wide range, uh, but a very substantial contribution can be made from biofertilizers. Now let me switch to phosphorus solubilization in the rhizosphere. Most uh, soil phosphorus is insoluble. There are some microbes that can secrete organic acids to solubilize rock phosphorus. Others release chelators that capture cations from insoluble phos phosphorus complexes, such as calcium, aluminum, and iron, thus liberating phosphate. Others, microbes can actually mineralize organic phosphorus, so th through um, phosphatases. There's numerous species that do this, most famously Bacillus, Pseudomonas, and then also Penicillium and Aspergillus fungi. Here's a particular bacteria discovered in, in my lab, again, labeled in green. We're looking at a root in red. Under a soluble phosphorus environment, there's very few of these green bacteria. In an insoluble phosphorus environment, they seem to multiply and be selected. Uh, this can colonize the root hair. And then if you put these seedlings either coated with this bacteria called 3F11 or not, it changes uh, an acid indicator dye. So what 3F, strain 3F11 is doing here is it's acidifying uh, the environment and thus solubilizing rock phosphorus. Next, we turn to potassium solubilization in the rhizosphere or soil. 98% of soil potassium is trapped within crystal structures, but it can be liberated by organic acids or by chelation. I apologize for the spelling mistake. Uh, these can be Bacillus bacteria, Aspergillus niger fungi, many others. And so here now I've covered NPK. But we can also turn to uh, sink um, and, sand and silicate solubilization in the rhizosphere soil. Only 1% of soil zinc is water soluble. Most zinc fertilizer, when it's added, actually is also rapidly converted to insoluble forms. We know that zinc that the World Health Organization has identified zinc as a critical missing micronutrient in diets. If it's not uh, available in the soil, it's not in the plant, and then humans and livestock are deficient. Microbes can solubilize zinc and also silica, silicate in soils and rhizosphere, again, by acidification and or chelation. Um, Burkholderia, Rhizobia, Entrobacter, Bacillus. Again, I apologize for a spelling mistake there. Now, Apart from fixation or solubilization, in general, the uh, um, mycorrhizal fungi and other microbes can facilitate nutrient mobilization, which is essentially mobilizing um, these nutrients and also water from soil to the root by increasing the root absorption area um, and allowing, uh, allowing some of these nutrients to, to reach smaller soil pores. 
most famous of these are mycorrhizal fungi or vesicular um, or muscular mycorrhizal fungi or VAM. Uh, and that is an ancient symbiosis on Earth going back 400 million years. Uh, but there are biofertilizer opportunities in some cases to improve that symbiotic relationship. A new innovation here is the application of consortia of microbes. This is a package from India. So in this case, it's called NPK booster. It fixes free atmospheric nitrogen. It, there's another strain that solubilizes phosphorus and another strain that mobilizes potassium. You might be surprised to learn about the market share of each inoculant. So this is uh, recent data from India. And what I've highlighted here is the percentage share in total in terms of biofertilizer sold or distributed as a percentage. You can see in 2016, only 8% of biofertilizers are rhizobium. Actually, azospirillum is 12% and phosphate solubilizer is 30%. Uh, potassium mobilizer, KMB is 6%. Uh, VAM that I discuss, dis, discussed is 10%, and the NP, NPK consortium I just discussed is 8%. So this is a very vibrant area. The sector has gone well beyond rhizobium. Let me now turn to the general argument for the use of microbes in the tropics and subtropics. So, so what is smallholder farming? These are parcels of land less than two hect hectares. So imagine 200 meters by 100 meters, and imagine making one's entire food supply, uh, and also potentially profit from that small parcel of land. This encompasses 400 million smallholder farms, primarily in the tropics and subtropics. If you multiply by a family of five, these support 2 billion people. They need more yield with greater nutritional value from their own farms for food and for profit. Superimposed on this are approximately 800 million people who are chronically malnourished. Why? is this malnourishment primarily happening in the tropics and the subtropics. As the Earth spins, we know that the equator is closest to the sun and hot air rises and it carries moisture with it and that moisture falls as rainfall. And so the equator, of course, gets year-round rainfall. That, that moisture, however, is drawn continuously as the Earth spins from north and south of the equator, the subtropics. So paradoxically, the driest places on Earth, which are in the subtropics, are next to the wettest places on Earth, the equator, because the two are connected. As a result, for example, Africa, which is located dead center on the equator, has, one could say, the curse of suffering from too much rainfall and the north and south suffering from too little rainfall, simply because how the tectonic plates landed. The effect of too much rain on chemical fertilizers, synthetic chemical fertilizers, or mined or synthetic chemical fertilizers, is that year-round heavy rain causes rapid leaching of fertilizers and nutrients. Nitrate is soluble in water and leached in, in, from soil, reducing amino acids in crops, leading to protein malnutrition in humans and livestock. Because of this uh, leaching, there's low soil organic matter. Uh, there's a lot of organic matter above ground, for example, in rainforests, but very little below ground. Uh, organic matter, you know, DNA, proteins, etc., they have positive and negative charges. Those positive and negative charges normally would bind fertilizers, which are inher inherently charged, positive or negative. So in the tropics, however, those charges are lacking and fertilizers cannot bind effectively in the soil. Acidic soils, uh, which are inherent in the tropics, reduce bioavailability uptake of added chemical fertilizers, including PK and zinc. Now, what is the effect of insufficient rain on chemical fertilizers? So now we're talking about the north and south, the subtropics. And 75% of global malnutrition is in the subtropics, primarily in South Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Intermittent rain, this is characterized by intermittent rain with prolonged dry seasons. There is inherently low soil organic matter because there's low vegetation. Again, that means low charge residues in the soil uh, and low fertilizer retention. This area is characterized by sandy soils because of low organic matter. The large pore size causes rapid fertilizer leaching. Uh, water leaches nitrate. It reduces amino acids in crops, leading to, again, to protein malnutrition. 
Now, the onset of the first rains after the dry season causes runoff of topsoils, which can contain these fertilizers, especially on hillsides in East Africa, where about 300 million people live. And then, of course, there's insufficient water to allow nitrate, which is water soluble, to flow to roots. Now, so therefore, chemical fertilizers have inherent challenges in the tropics and subtropics. Can microbial biofertilizers overcome these challenges in the subtropics and, and tropics? First, in, the, in, the, in, the, in case of the challenge of acidic soils reducing nutrient availability, it's less of a problem if microbes deliver nutrients directly inside a plant. It doesn't matter what the acidity is outside. In terms of leaching or runoff of nutrients in the soil, again, it may not be a problem if microbes colonize and deliver nutrients directly inside plants or if they directly stick onto the root surface, the rhizoplane, as I showed you earlier. The lack of water in the subtropics to, to permit nitrate to solubilize in water and flow to the root zone, again, it may not be a problem if microbes deliver nutrients directly inside plants. In terms of the substantial poverty in this region, Microbes can potentially become resident in the soil or have the potential to be inherited in seeds, that is a bit more ambitious, thus reducing fertilizer input costs. We know that rhizobia inoculants, for example, can build up after in particular about three seasons of inoculation. Now, in terms of there, we know that there are insufficient resources to breed local crop land races, indigenous farmer land races. Microbes could prevent displacement of local seeds selected over thousands of years while allowing for new traits to be introduced, such as root stimulation or phosphate solubilization. Other benefits of biofertilizers compared to chemical fertilizers for smallholder farmers, in addition to NPK, zinc, and other benefits, other benefits include they can promote root growth because, for example, they can secrete plant hormones, which allows for uh, overall better uptake of fertilizer and water, critical in the subtropics. They can promote grain yield by various mechanisms. They can also combat competitor crop pathogens and insects and nematodes, thus reducing the need for fungicides and pesticides. So hence biofertilizers can have multifunction benefits compared to chemical fertilizers, which typically have a single direct benefit. And indeed, for example, in India, biofertilizers have shown a greater return on investment compared to chemical fertilizers, at least based on a meta-analysis of research trials. What I'm showing you boxed in orange is the biofertilizer cost per kilogram of nutrient acquired compared to uh, a, a chemical. So for example, if you look at rhizobium in terms of nitrogen, it's 2.6 rupees per hectare compared to the equivalent, of uh, equivalent amount of nitrogen uh, 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 from chemical fertilizer about five-fold higher. If you were to look at phosphate solubilization, uh, the second last row at the bottom, you can see that uh, ratio is uh, that uh, Biofertilizers are approximately 43-fold more cost-effective, at least based on this meta-analysis. Now, I don't want to only be a cheerleader for biofertilizers. There are many disadvantages of biofertilizers. I'll show you one from work from my own lab. This is uh, a fuel trial that we did with farmers in Nepal. So in this trial, uh, 55 to 65% of smallholder farmers, we worked primarily with women farmers on Nepalese terraces, showed increased yields of common bean with a $1 rhizobia inoculant. But what's critical and what is often not reported is that other farmers, we worked with hundred, hundred, you know, about 100 farmers here, other farmers lost yield. And, and, and that's shown in this graph. So. Um, the blue are those farmers that gained in yield. The red are those farmers that actually had greater than uh, a loss of greater than 5% in yield. So, um, you know, the benefits of biofertilizers, these estimates vary widely between studies in the literature. I believe one should look at some studies, biofertilizer studies, with some degree of healthy skepticism. And also note perhaps what is not being reported. What are some other disadvantages of biofertilizers compared to chemical fertilizers? First of all, not every microbe is safe to human health, such as many Klebsiella species. They're in fact quite dangerous. S some can have, many can have a very short shelf life. A chemical is inert. A microbe is a living organism. So the short shelf life and variable qual product quality 
due to high temperatures in the tropics and subtropics, causing drying out, excuse me, during storage and um, um, transport or in the field after application. Micros may prefer specific plant varieties, not others, um, as hosts. And in fact, microbes may be recognized as an enemy, not a friend. And number five, inoculants can become contaminated with crop pathogens um, during shipment or storage. If there's, for example, a slight puncture in their bag, they may be outcompeted by endogenous plant and soil microbes in the field. I already showed you that the endogenous microbiome consists of millions and millions of bacteria. When one adds an inoculant, you're asking it to outcompete the endogenous microbiome. There, there can be vari variable temperature of soil nutrients, pH, causing variability in microbial activity under field conditions. And then there, we know that there can be very poor access to extension training services and low literacy to uh, prepare and apply biofertilizers, as I introduced earlier. So thus, real-world studies show that biofertilizers sometimes have poor results in the field. Let me conclude by talking about current and future access to biofertilizers by smallholder farmers. What is the current access to microbial biofertilizers? So Brazil, which of course is, is, is a wealthier nation, uh, it, is, it is a leader in biofertilizer, both research and use. Uh, there's strong government and BRAPA-led research um, combined with the private sector, and that partnership for example, has enabled 70 million doses of inoculants sold in 2019. In India, similarly, there is a very vibrant commercial sector, for example, as is Brilliant, with 100 industries under the Biotech Consortium India umbrella. This is supported by government labs. For example, they've recently made 2,000 isolations of novel rhizobia um, and other institutions, various regional centers, 58 biofertilizer production units, especially in southern India. In China, recently there have been 800 patents related to microbial inoculation. In North Africa, there's progress in, in Morocco, for example. There's a new university, uh, UM6P. They've started a, they've hired an, a number of crop microbiome faculty. I happen to be a, uh, an honorary professor at that university. And, and also there are Moroccan inoculant companies. Um, Egypt, for example, through their Mearson Initiative, also distributes inoculants. What about in Sub-Saharan Africa? Unfortunately, in this case, in much of Sub-Saharan Africa, but not all, there's only pilot scale biofertilizer capacity, better in a few countries. There's a very small commercial sector, perhaps except for South Africa. There are some high profile projects such as the Gates funded foundation N2 Africa for nitrogen fixation, um, IIT in Nigeria for rhizobia. Um, and then the microbiolog microbiological resource centers, MIRSINs, um, in different parts of Africa, but typically these initiatives are only reaching tens of thousands of smallholder farmers. So then moving forward, what is needed? We know that the backbone of smallholder agriculture are women farmers. This is actually a, um, a wonderful, wonderful uh, women farmer that I have worked with in, in South Asia. We know that number one, there is a need for extension personnel to train women and male farmers in terms of how to prepare and apply biofertilizers. Because as I said, it is a little bit complex. One only needs very simple tools such as water and you know, buckets, et cetera, but one has to be trained how to do that and that requires a minimum amount of literacy. We need scalable extension materials that feature women farmers. Um, so uh, myself and an illustrator, we've created, uh, just as an example of this, a 200-page picture book, which is freely available at sapbooks.com to download. What we're showing here uh, is how a farmer can simply take a Zola from one rice field, rice paddy, and introduce it to another rice paddy in a very simple way, although there's more complex ways of inoculating. Um, there, we need large-scale innovative extension that is interesting. Um, so this is a fantastic TV show in East Africa uh, called Shamba Shape Up. And what they do is they go to individual farms and they diagnose their problems. Those of you who live in the West, you may know of home improvement shows. This is a smallholder farm improvement show. Um, and they bring in technical experts. And for example, they've had 12, 12 million viewers. In terms of radio, we know that Farm Radio International, which by the way, started at my university, uh, that many farmers around the world listen to radio and pre-recorded calls to cell phones uh, just to create awareness of, of the biofertilizer technologies. 
We need participatory approaches to learn from farmers, to learn from farmers about their needs, constraints, and their abilities. So for example, as I said earlier, we conducted rhizobial uh, biofertilizer field trials with women farmers in Nepal as part of our sustainable agriculture kit for Nepal project. For biofertilizers to scale up, their formulations must be sufficiently stable to be able to be, to be sold at village level stalls because most commercial activity at the village level occurs in these stalls. Um, now, in my experience, where if I, whether I've traveled in the Congo or India or anywhere in the world, I could always buy, if I wanted to, cigarettes, <laughs> beer, potato chips. Um, so that means there are distribution networks that exist. In, in one of our projects, for example, we have sold products, agricultural technologies through these distributors on consignment. But in the case of biofertilizers, they have to be accompanied by clear step-by-step -step instructions for low literacy farmers, particularly female farmers. So for example, uh, in our pictures, we created a, um, you know, a simple, um, in, well, they're not, it's actually not that simple when one thinks about it, instructions that one would go uh, to a vendor, purchase a biofertilizer, add a sticky agent, you know, add it to their seeds. So this, the, the goal here is that if a farmer were to buy a biofertilizer, they would have a little brochure accompanying with it uh, uh, in, in a local language uh, with, with pictures. Fourth, smallholders would benefit from a dedicated CGIAR microbiome institute um, that would have a large global biofertilizer or biopesticide bank, or at least a microbank at each, at each CGIAR institute, similar to, the, to IITA in Nigeria, which I discussed earlier. Five, for biofertilizers to be effective, a restaurant menu approach May, may be beneficial to remove other constra constraints that are specific for an individual smallholder farm or household. So for example, in our SAC project, we created a regional menu of innovations from which smallholder farmers can pick and choose individual items for purchase, typically two to $10, which is within a female's, female farmer's decision-making um, power. So, what are some of these innovations? So apart from inoculant, perhaps greater access to legume seeds. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sorry, that's a vegetable seed package, not a legume seed package there. Um, small seed packages of micro and macronutrients. Uh, we know that potassium, phosphorus, sulfur um, can be very uh, effective for legumes to, uh, and will assist inoculants. Gloves, why gloves? That assists women farmers to collect farmyard manure and also to collect thorny weeds. Um, um, very simple rakes that actually the women farmers designed, again, to help collect farm, farmyard manure or weeding, which is done manually. Some sort of a small irrigation system so that uh, legume seedlings can be started earlier in the season um, to, to maximize the production time. And then there's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help if one has higher yield of legumes or, or, or maize if there's, if there's improper storage. So hermetically sealed grain storage bags, which only cost one or $2. And then increased production does not help typically unless it is connected to markets. So some sort of strategy so that farmers can sell this. So this is an integrated package approach, but any one farmer may only want one or two of these products and it should be their choice to empower them. Long-term, the greatest benefit from microbes may not derive from inoculants alone, but from an integrated approach with chemical, uh, appropriate chemical fertilizers, and by investing in breeding seeds for improved native microbiomes using microbe-specific molecular markers, similar to how breeding is done with plant chromosome markers. I already told you there's a fantastic, beautiful abundance of microbes in the plant. We now need to to, to select for that more carefully. I wanna thank you for your, uh, your patience today. What I tried to discuss today is to introduce you to microbial biofertilizers, discuss specific types of microbial biofertilizers, try to make the general argument for the use of microbes in the tropics and subtropics where chemical fertilizers have inherent disadvantages because of rainfall patterns, um, talk, honestly about the disadvantages of biofertilizers, particularly their farm to farm and season to season variability, and discuss current and future, how to increase future access to biofertilizers by smallholder farmers. 
I'd like to thank you, FAO and I IFO, uh, uh, IFA for this privilege to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rai Zada, for this very comprehensive and excellent introduction um, into this whole topic. Um, without losing further time, um, we will now further delve into uh, the commercial development of microbes with Jean-Marc Sanchez. Uh, Jean-Marc Sanchez is an agronomist with over 20 years of experience in developing biofertilizers, biocontrol agents, and stimulants for agriculture. And he manages currently the technical marketing department of L'Allemand Plant Care, a global leader in the development, production, and marketing of yeast, bacteria, and fungus. Um, Mr. Sanchez will talk about breeding technologies as well as further address the, the, the challenges of delivering continuous efficiency in the field and adapting it to farmers' practices. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, Manesh, for this great uh, presentation. Do you see my screen? That's okay, Yvonne? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yes, yes, Manesh, you present the general principle for uh, biofertilizer, and then uh, here I will try to present the challenge we have uh, as a microbial company uh, to find the good strain, the good microbes, and to make it happen into the field creating value for, for the farmer. Uh, so I'm Jean-Marc Sanchez, so, and, and the Lallemand Group is uh, not a fertilizer uh, company. We are not a plant protection company. We are really a, a microbial company. And then we have uh, more than 42 plants that are dedicated for uh, producing bacteria, yeast, fungus. And the general idea when you are developing a, a fertilizer, but Manesh explained that a little bit, is that we want to create, to build small factory in the root system, uh, billions of small factory that you can see on the, on the image. Because the microbes have the advantage to, to live, so to reproduce, as soon as they find the good place to live in, the, the food, they will multiply, and they will produce metabolite, metabolite that can be enzyme, organic acid, that can be uh, phytohormones, hydrophore, different um, metabolite that will unlock nutrient, fix nitrogen, oxidize the phosphorus, uh, oxidize the sulfur, solubilizing the, the phosphorus, or um, uh, chelate the iron or uh, developing the root system as Manej was explaining. And that's a co-evolution. That's really a, a great thing because the cost is only from the, the sugar from the, the photosynthesis uh, for the plant. It has a cost and the payback will be, will be great for her. And as Manish was explaining, uh, the plant is never alone and it comes from a co-evolution. Uh, Manish already showed you that kind of graph when you can see the microbes, but it makes you understand how much the root system of a plant is colonized. These green fluorescence protein that are able, that, that makes us tracking the, the bacteria and to see that they are localized around the root system, in the root system are really great to concretely see that microbes are all over the, the root system. But you know that till the beginning of the agriculture, we have selected the, the crop, the varieties. Uh, we try to find the best crop, the best varieties to produce uh, the best yield, the more resistance to abiotic stress or disease or pest. But we didn't select the micro, microbiome, the microorganisms that are really the partner. And we have to now to think about the plant and the microbe as a whole. And you cannot separate them because they are quite together to be stronger and facing the environment and the stress so together. So wh what we are doing is trying to select microbes and to find new partner to the new varieties that we've, we've, we have selected uh, during the last decades with the new uh, um, molecular biology tool or genetic tool that, that we have. Uh, you can see that heterosis effect. The idea is to combine two genetics, uh, one from the microbes, the other one from the plants. Let me show you a recent paper 
I'm trying to go faster to leave the question. So let me show you a paper that has been released recently is, is, that is illustrating what I was saying. These guys, they have taken 20 variety of corn that was selected during the last 50 years. So you can see on the vertical, on the horizontal axis that the, the, these are the year where when the corn variety has been selected, each dot or uh, variety. And they have made, they have grown the, the, the corn in pots with natural soil, and they have make an analysis about all the bacteria microbiome around the root system. And they have take a picture of that and trying to have a quantity of genes, bacterial gene, uh, in charge of fixing nitrogen. And you can see that there is a trend that is showing that the recent varieties that has been selected for a yield or whatever over achievement we want, they, the, the microbiome that has been recruited that this variety are less uh, 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 able to fix nitrogen. And on the other side, they have more and more uh, bacteria that have the capacity to make the nitrogen volatilizing. It means that denut denutrification is when you transform the nitrate into the soil, into the gas, and to, that is exactly the contrary to fixation. So we have selected varieties without taking into account microbes. That's what we are trying to do, and it could be interesting now to inoculate, to reintroduce the good partner uh, to these new varieties. And, and inoculation could be really interesting. But as Manesh was explaining, we have billions of different candidates and we have to choose the best one. And the way we will do that will be really important. Uh, so that's uh, a graph is an example of, of on pea and lentils with rhizobium, which is a bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria, rhizobium leguminosarum. Each dot is um, bacteria. On the horizontal axis, you have the competitiveness. It means that each bacteria, when she wants to create a nodule to enter into the plant, it's a race. And the one that will win the race will be the one that will form the nodule. You have only one strain of bacteria in one nodule. So the competitiveness, the capacity to be the first to create the nodule is very important for a bacteria. And that's what you see on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, you have the efficiency, it means how many nitrogen this bacteria is able to fix, how many shoot dry matter, uh, the, how many yield, and that's the efficacy uh, for the bacteria. And you can see that sometimes bacteria that are really competitive and that could be native in the soil, they are not really effective compared to over bacteria that are really, really effective here on the left, up left of the, of the graph, but not competitive. So we will try to choose different parameters for bacteria, being competitive, be efficient, and you can see an example here. So what I want to say that the first challenge we have, and sometimes companies are saying we have billions or thousands or millions of bacteria, bacteria or fungus, but it's not about the number. It's how you will choose from this huge number of candidates, the best strain, how you can make trial, what is your model in terms of screening to find the good, the good strain. Most of the company uh, are doing petri dishes, you know, on the top left, you can see petri dishes. So it's easier to make screening on a petri dishes because when you have thousands of, of, of strain doing that directly in the field, it's really, really, a lot of resource and, and, and money and surface. So sometimes we are doing traditional screening. In that case, it's not really uh, realistic because in the real life, in the soil, the behavior of the bacteria will not necessarily be the same. Here you can see in the blue Dishes, different colony of bacteria that are producing Siderophore and Siderophore to late 
iron, but in this growing media, they are producing metabolite to chelate iron, but in the real life, do you think they will do that? We have to check. So most of the time we are doing greenhouse trials with natural soil because we want to respect the competition, natural competition, but it's a lot of efforts. For example, for phosphorylization, it took us uh, more than three years to find a good model that could be discriminant, simulating the way we apply the phosphorus granule, so it takes time. When we have the good screening model, when we find the good, can the good strain in the middle of billions of candidates, we have to produce and we produce in big fermenters uh, to be cost effective. And you know, to be cost effective, we have to find the good recipe, the good parameters. And depending on the way you produce a bacteria, you can change the behavior of the bacteria in the field and the efficacy or even the toxicity can change. So here is an example of the same bacteria we produce in three different process, changing recipe, the, the food for the plant, the, the oxygenation, all these parameters, and it will change the behavior. It's like when you are educating twins, your child, and then if you are educating in a different way, it's breeding, that's living organism, they can change their behavior in the fields. So we have to be really consistent in the way, if we want to be cost effective and consistent in the way to produce, to be sure that the efficacy will be the same. And finally, we have to adapt our solution to the farming system. That's really important because the efficacy is depending on that. And that's the problem we have. Not about the efficacy. The problem could be about the consistency of the efficacy. Look at the two pictures that corn in the same area, you know, same climate, corn uh, here on the left and the corn with crop residue on the right. And if you apply a bacteria on the soil, uh, 40 degrees Celsius, uh, no water, uh, drought, uh, it will be less effective than when you have a soil with moisture that could help the bacteria to multiply. So we have to integrate our solution with advice and to give the good advice to the farmer. First, the equipment. When you want to apply, generally farmers, they don't want to apply only one product because it's a lot of money, resource, time. So we have to find a way to mix with herbicide, for example, or chemical product. So we need to evaluate the compatibility and the provider are ready to give this information to the client. Is it compatible in a tank mix or with this herbicide, with fertilizer, even we can stick the bacteria, the fungus on the seed or on the fertilizer granule, but it has to be checked the shelf life on the granule before and after all that stuff that has been to provide by the provider. And of course, check the compatibility with chemical, with over biological, and the crop rotation is really important. And I will show you some example, but we know, for example, that when you want to apply mycorrhizae, the, the cruciferaceae, oil seed rape, or a canola will be, will decrease the population, will be antagonism. And there is some example I can show you that there is a lot of parameters that make the efficacy of a microbes into the field. It could be the variety. Here, you can see an example of the same bacteria we tried on 16 different varieties of rice with Sirad. You can see the red bar and the, that, that show the inoculated uh, varieties and the black bar is the control, the non-inoculated. And we measure the rice roots weight. And you can see that there is difference depending on varieties. And even the V16 is not really efficient with this bacteria. That's important to know. You know that mycorrhizae and phosphorus, the timing of application of phosphorus fertilization is really important because if you apply the phosphorus solubilized phosphate, at the same time you apply mycorrhizae during the period of mycorrhizae needs to enter into the root system to start to give a benefits to the plant, it can inhibit the phosphorus application. It can inhibit this 
uh, uh, symbiosis, which migrates away. So you have to change your way to fertilize, maybe after, maybe before, maybe more in a more different way, but it's always complementary to the fertilization, but it has to change a little bit. So we have to adapt our way to advise depending on the farmer uh, practi practice. Uh, these are an example uh, of uh, on leguminous uh, pea and lentils with rhizobium steel. And you can see that if you have legume history or non legume history, you have a different benefit uh, from the inoculation. So uh, if we inoculate uh, a rhizobium and pea and lentils that has not have any history in, in legume, you will have approximately in that case was 19 percent of yield increase. And, and in case of legume history was 5% increase. So uh, let me talk to you now about the shelf life. And because that's the main constraint we have, uh, most of the companies and the product can put on the market Bacillus, you know, maybe Bacillus is a bacteria that is sporulant bacteria. So you propose spores, spores is a really robust and, and really great for the shelf life and the stability because they are reproducing in spores. It's a kind of protection against the environment. But there is a lot of good, good bacteria and fungus that could be really effective, but the, the shelf life and the stability is not uh, really good. So you have to put that in the fridge to have a one year shelf life. So we are working a lot and there is a lot of innovation coming. We can work on the way to pro pro produce. We can work on the packaging, uh, non-vacuum packaging. We can work about the formulation and depending on the way you produce, you can change the shelf life. Here is an example of a fungus, which is really uh, weak. Uh, we had three month shelf life at room temperature and we succeed in having one year at home temperature, which could be really uh, uh, interesting for the market. So that may, maybe that will be one of the question we, we you, you will have. I'm trying to go to, to accelerate a little bit of time for the question. A really important point for us, and you were talking about challenge to put on the market, that is a big challenge where we are struggling, I would say, every day because the uh, registration and the way to, to have access to the market with the regulatory things is quite a nightmare. Uh, we are a microbial company. We, we deal with plant protection product. We deal with uh, fertilizer biostimulant, whatever, and in many, many countries, it's not the same, it's, there is no harmonization. Every country has this, their own uh, legacy based on molecule. And when you arrive in a country, you try to register a microbe. I would tell you my first experience was in France 20 years ago. When I, when I tried to register a they asked me the, the boiling point of my spores. That was an example of now, it was 20 years ago, but now we have a lot of problem. Most of them are, you know, uh, uh, we have to demonstrate that our microbe is not a fungicide or the plant protection product. As you know, every microbe are doing both. They are competing in, in the same eco ecological niche. So they are competing for the food. So even a mycorrhizae or rhizobium can be a plant protection product at the end. So it's really complicated. And some states are asking us to demonstrate something that is not really uh, possible. Uh, we have a lot of things to say on that will be a question. We need more uh, uh, adequate or appropriate uh, and, and resources for that. i give you to finish. This example will be uh, on my 20 minutes, Yvonne, uh, at the end. Uh, I, I will, uh, I, I'm showing you that because we need, for example, to do a, a trial in the micro plot for regulation, regulation to demonstrate the efficacy in some country in Europe uh, of our product. But the, the micro plot are two meters on 10 meters for re replication and you know cross cross contamination you put the bacteria on this on this plot here in the middle that could be the treated one the control is just over there 
on the left. And uh, during six months, the bacteria will expand and we go from one to each other. So we have a lot of, that's an example of agronomic evaluation that we have to face and to change the model to try our product. Finally, and that will be my last slide, we need science, we need academics, we need companies uh, to work on that. There is so many things to put on the market to have a greater shelf life, to fix nitrogen in a consistent way for the plants, uh, to give advice to the farmer, and we suffer about credibility. That's the problem. We want regulation, we need regulation, because we need uh, credibility, of course, but we need an appropriate regulation, that's it. And that will be my, my last sentence. John, I hope we have time to get some question. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, yes, we have, but we have received so many questions um, that I'm afraid um, we will not be able to answer all of them. Uh, feel free to write to us um, and send your questions um, at the end of, of the session and, and uh, we will do our best to, to, to provide individual, more detailed responses. Um, let me just, um, you know, take some minutes and at least address more the, the more general ones. Um, so we received the question about the use of uh, synthesized chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and how far these could impact the microbes and their relationship with crop plants in farming environments. Um, who wants to take this? Mr. Raizada, um, are you maybe start? Uh, and then uh, Jean-Marc Sanchez, if you would like to compliment. Sure. Uh, so one way, uh, for so for example, uh, farmers can add different types of chemicals. It can be adding uh, nitrogen fertilizer. We know that nitrogen for, that that nitrogen fixing microbes have a feedback inhibition mechanism. So if there's too much nitrogen in their environment they will shut down nitrogen fixation, biological nitrogen fixation. Interestingly, uh, one of the uh, private sector products I showed, one of, the, one of the advances they made with gene editing was they knocked out that feedback inhibition. So in other words, that microbe can now see synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in its environment and it will still fix nitrogen. Other classes of chemical inputs, of course, can be fungicides. Some of them can be systemic fungicides that are coated onto seeds. Of course, that could disrupt uh, the, the uh, beneficial fungi that are, that are carried onto seeds. But what I will say in general is um, to have an integrated approach between biofertilizers and chemical inputs, one can usually achieve that or often achieve that by applying those at different times. Okay, so if there's concern that some chemical input might be detrimental to a biofertilizer that's being added, they can simply be added at different times. That alone will mitigate some of the issues. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sanchez, do you want to compliment? Yeah, I, I will just say that I agree that the compatibility could be on, on two ways. The first, the compatibility, when you apply the product, you have to check that the, the, the living organism is, is compatible with, for example, a fungus. If you apply it with a fungicide, maybe they could be have some problem. But um, sometimes we summarize a little bit too much, and I agree with Manesh because we say, uh, phosphorus is not compatible with mycorrhizae is not the case. The question is that, for example, the mycorrhizae, she has a, there is a period, specific period, where you don't have to go above a threshold of a concentration of solubilized phosphorus in the soil solution. So it's more complex than that. So you have to think about your fertilization in applying maybe lower dose before, a greater after. It's a question of timing. And these are really compatible, but it's not opposing because the mycorrhizae to unlock phosphorus, she needs phosphorus. Of course, she will not create the phosphorus, but it's a question of timing, like I was saying, uh, and those and kind of phosphorus you, you are applying. So it's more complicated than that. 
I mean, uh, you know, the fertilizer industry, when it comes to mineral and organic fertilizer applications, we we promote this kind of for our concept, you know, using the right source um, at the right dose in the right um, place at the right time. Um, it, it sounds like what you just explained is, is, is there something that could similarly emerge um, here, despite the complexity of, of, of this whole field that both of you just uh, explained? Um, uh, Mr. Sanchez, if, if you just want to continue a little bit yeah. that idea, is this possible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, we are working on that because, you know, it's just about you are sending a microbes and you give it to the farmer and you apply it like he, he was applying a, a, a mineral product or even organic product. And the, the way and the most difficult in our job is to explain what is the ecosystem around that because this microbe, he has to balance with the ecosystem. So how to apply when during the evening, during the summer, the moisture in the soil, what do you have to do? The compatibility. What will you do with the fertilization? Because all we are microbes, only one tool in the middle of the tool that, that the farmer has. So it's not miracle product. Uh, you can fix nitrogen, okay, but you cannot fix potassium or phosphorus because there is no. So you have to really uh, explain how to apply, how to respect the shelf life and the company, the academics, Everybody has to give this advice to the farmer. And that's exactly what you were saying. There is a lot of study about uh, a precision hag. And that's a precision hag that we have to, to do with the microbes, with the fertilization. And is, is there a specific machinery technology that, that, is, that is on the market of being used? Um, for, to, to optimize the efficiency, the effectiveness of biofertilizers? Okay, maybe it's still me. I can yeah. tell you. Yeah, well, I will switch afterwards to your colleague. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. Um, there is a lot of of research on that, and that's a really good question. How we can provide to the former a solution means, uh, for example, with inoculant, we are trying to work on granule where you can uh, have the protection of the rhizobium inside to ensure a good stability, a good shelf life, and a good distribution around the seed and not on the seed coating, because when you apply on the seed, you have to be compatible with chemicals. So there is, I will say that in most of the case, we, as a biocontrol industry, we are trying to uh, be uh, uh, easy to use with the existing equipment, sprayer, uh, fertilizer, but we are maybe adjusting a little bit when the sprayer, there is too much pressure, which we can change the nozzle, we can change a little bit, but um, not really trying to change completely the equipment of the farmer. We are trying to stick on what is existing with small change and adaptation. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, another question, and, and I think that's a, that's a question that goes uh, to both of you. Um, and I would like to start with Mr. Rai um, uh, for you know for the response. Um, where where do you see the main markets for microbials? Um, the, the the systems um, of intensive agriculture, rather in the Western world, or the low input agriculture um, in 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 some other developing world um, uh, countries and regions in Africa? Um, what is what 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 are your estimations? Also thinking about the future of of this market. So. Um... In terms of getting this technology to uh, smallholder farmers, uh, the issue really is around the stability as Jean-Marc has discussed. It's improving that stability and shelf life and improving the accessibility in terms of simplifying the application. If some of those issues can be improved, the market in the developing world is enormous. And we already see for example, in India, you know, India for a long time, uh, products like Aethosperillium rhizobium, you know, they have been marketed very successfully to smallholder farmers. So the market there is enormous. If we look long term in terms of global population, we know that 
uh, later in my lifetime, 40% of the world's population will be in Africa, primarily sub-Saharan Africa. So just population demographics feature into this, that there is going to be a very large market for biofertilizers in Africa. In Western countries, Europe, uh, the United States, Canada, there is a burgeoning of startup companies. Those products are often around nitrogen. Some of those are being mandated by government regulations. Um, ch changing government regulations to reduce, um, uh, you know, to, to reduce our uh, fossil fuel use, particularly with uh, nitrogen fertilization. So, in some cases, consumers and and regulatory agencies will will drive some of this change. There is a wonderful opportunity that I we that we didn't talk about. One can breed uh, annual crops like maize, but then there's tree crops, perennial crops that are very difficult to breed. And in this case, my, microbials have a, you know, have, a, have a really wonderful future to introduce traits rather quickly. And um, Mr. Sanchez, do you want to complement uh, what, how no. you see the market evolving? I agree. I will say that indeed the microbes can be really powerful and that, that there is disadvantage that Manesh was saying that there is it could be powerful where it, it, it can multiply and uh, having the good media and the good place. I, I will say that the market will, will develop and is developing where there is the needs and where it sometimes, you know, in Europe or uh, in Canada, whatever, there is some limitation. You cannot uh you cannot you, you cannot apply what you what you want there is a, a limitation and in that case you have to optimize what you already have or in some case you don't have the organic matter break down and there is no no life in the soil so and these needs happen where it happened and i see that it happened even in intensive crop like we are doing in, in some country really trying to push the yield as much as we can on one hectare of land. But uh, now I, I really think that is moving and there is a trend towards the conservation agriculture when people are trying to uh, think about the crop rotation, the cover crop, and it happens everywhere. I mean, even in, in Europe, in, in, in North America, and of course in Asia, in South America, so these are good things because people are thinking agronomy and they are thinking about the life in the soil, the partnership, the symbiosis, how to complexify the ecosystem, how to make it more resilient because we all face the same problem of the climate change, of the scarcity of the, of the things. So conservation hack, complexity of the ecosystem and the microbes is one tool in the middle of the tool that the farmer have. And that's somewhere, that's everywhere, sorry, even in the world. I, I'm traveling a lot, I was traveling a lot before and I can see that in Brazil, in China, in, in North America, in Europe. So I think it's really global. So, so at, at this stage, um, uh, you know, and, and, and you both touched a little bit upon it already, uh, w uh, you know, regulatory plays a role um, for further development. Um, what would you say are today regulatory constraints or are there regulatory constraints from your perspective, um, barriers that, that you both believe should be overcome? What, what would be your message um, to policymakers? I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> Mr. Raizada? Um, you know, from, I guess, um, my perspective as a researcher, the primary barrier that uh, I face is, is, is really the ease of being able to conduct uh, outdoor field experiments. So the, the costs associated with, see, when we, when we do indoor trials, lab trials, greenhouse trials, they have very limited value. Uh, in terms of what will happen in the real world outside. So the faster we can go to the field, uh, it, it is a bit of a numbers game, whether we're trying to test a large number of candidates or trying to breed some candidates, the, the faster we can go into a field environment, the better it is. So what I've recommended, for example, to the Canadian government is they set up a dedicated um, large area outside in different spots outside that researchers with very minimal permitting paperwork can do can do research trials. And that ultimately is for the societal good. 
I think when we're talking about at the commercial level, I think it's better if I turn it over to my, my colleague. Yes, my side, sorry, it's a big, big, <laughs> big issue for me. And I'm, I'm struggling with, I'm struggling with that till many years, 20 years now. And I have seen the change and I can tell you that we need people that understand microbes in the regulatory people. We need that. Absolutely, because we lose time in explaining, asking questions that are not appropriated to us. I can give you many details, but we don't have the time today for experience. But if we, we want to give to farmer a good tool, that will be great. That's not miracle product. Please give us the opportunity to put innovation on the market. We want regulation. We want risk assessment because Manesh say that microbes can be dangerous, but we can prove that and we can discuss with people harmonization around the world and, and proposing regulatory. We, we are able with companies, uh, I mean, uh, uh, microbiologists to, to, to propose that. There is many, many, many issues there, uh, Yvonne. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Um, I, I think we, we hear you loud and clear and it looks like that would be even, uh, could even be a uh, topic of, of, of a, separate, a whole separate webinar, just listening to both of you. But, um, but I'm afraid now it's, it's really time to conclude. So, so the key takeaways are certainly that there is a lot of potential for research, for investments, for partnerships to ensure that um, these microbes are consistent, reliable enough to provide the long lasting effects on the plants. We heard that uh, they will never really replace chemicals, but a lot of complementary and synergetic functions are, are successful. Uh, and on the other hand, posing increasing challenges to the regulatory authorities um, who have to and are expected really now to respond much more swiftly and more effectively to, to the expectations um, of the market. Um, should you uh, be interested in hearing more about these solutions, but also about other um, cutting edge plant nutrition technologies, I would invite you to register to IFA Smart and Green Conference, which will start on June 8. But most importantly, I will also encourage you to stay tuned for the next FAO IFA joint webinars, um, which will take, which will place a focus on nutrient recycling fertigation solutions and data-driven nutrient management. Now, um, oh, I just received a message um, that um, Dr. Cha would also like to thank um, this audience. Um, so thanking our excellent speakers, I'm now handing the microphone to Dr. Cha for a final note. Dr. Cha. Okay, thank you very much, Ivona. And uh, I want to express my great thanks to excellent speaker uh, because I have some background, you know, uh, for research and also extension. I learn a lot. And I want to say everybody here, and we have still about 378, the highest number attend this meeting. And this is the topic is very important because now we are really want to say something about sustainable development. What is the approach? I think the green innovation is very important. What is green innovation? We should, you know, less deter of our environment. We should protect our environment. And of course, we all same time, we should increase productivity. However, and then one time we want increased productivity, one time we should protect our environment. I think a biofertilizer, is the best, efficient, effective way. And I can say feed all aspects about the sustainability. And I hope all the people here, please try our best. Now for realizing your next digital, only 10 years plus, 2021, 2030, only 10 years. There's a lot to do, concentrate something about the more innovation, great innovation to support sustainability. Over to you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, this this was absolutely great. Uh, thank you so much again, um, also to our speakers, to an excellent audience, um, very vivid. Um, I think everybody appreciated um, these presentations and the engagement. Sorry again for not having been able to respond to all these questions. Um, you can listen again, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, to this webinar uh, on the FAO YouTube channel. Uh, send your questions to us and uh, and again stay tuned for the next um, IFA FAO webinars and now um, well I wish you a good day a good night a good afternoon whoever you are um, and thanks thanks again bye 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 thank you bye bye bye.